But first, to the real legacy of Jacinda Ardern. Not the media fantasy, but what she really achieved during her disastrous reign. After enjoying one of the longest political honeymoons in modern politics, Ardern was facing what looked like certain defeat in the polls. And so, this week, she announced she's stepping down as PM. Ardern has been Prime Minister in New Zealand since 2017. And she has certainly left her mark on the country, soaring inflation, child poverty, crime and homelessness rates and a raft of broken and unfulfilled promises. And a Prime Minister that suffers from a chronic case of self-delusion. In fact, I am not leaving because I believe we can't win the election, but because I believe we can and will. And we need a fresh set of shoulders for that challenge. Yeah, sure. I'm sure that's why you're leaving. Nothing to do with this. New polling has revealed New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has suffered her lowest preferred PM ranking since becoming leader of the Labor Party in 2017. What we're also seeing is that the National and uh, the ACT Party who are aligned in New Zealand's parliament have a clear majority and could govern alone, uh, which would overthrow Labor in the next election. She leaves behind an almighty mess and it's due almost entirely to her disastrous social experiments. When she came to office, she promised that a flagship policy Kiwi Build would create 100,000 homes by 2028. As of May last year, it delivered just 1,300. Then there's her government's policy of Maori co-governance in the name of racial sovereignty, a project that's created all sorts of division and resentment. But the defining aspect of her legacy comes from shutting off New Zealand to the world. Her authoritarian lockdowns and draconian vaccine mandates that decimated the human rights of New Zealanders and destroyed businesses. But when you're a progressive darling, none of that matters. In the past 24 hours, we've seen extravagant fawning over Ardern from the likes of ABC presenters and leftist politicians. But the likes of Virginia Trioli and Monique Ryan conveniently overlook that Ardern came to power by entering a coalition with New Zealand First, the Kiwi equivalent of Pauline Hanson's One Nation. Her Labor Party came to power promising to slash immigration numbers and she needed Winston Peters' backing to become PM. But from the start, the media was obsessed with style over substance. They reported uncritically her grandiose pronouncements and portrayed Ardern as the doyen of empathy. But it was all performative. Winston Peters, the man who first installed Ardern as PM, has been scathing about the direction the country has taken under her rule. The disconnect from the liberal elite's woke cultural agenda and what happens in the real world is now all on show, he wrote in August last year. Peters also highlighted that despite her constant claims about kindness, Ardern's policies caused immense pain. The latest figures show that there are now around five times the number of people living in cars than there were before Labor was in government. How can the Be Kind Labor Party explain that? Typical of leftist leaders, Ardern has sought to shut down opposing views under the guise of combating so-called hate speech and disinformation. Her speeches in the US last year on this subject shocked many. Her main message, the spread of misinformation online. When facts are turned into fiction and fiction turned into fact, you stop debating ideas and you start debating conspiracy. Mis and disinformation online, a challenge that we must as leaders address. How do you tackle climate change if people do not believe it exists? How do you ensure the human rights of others are upheld when they are subjected to hateful and dangerous rhetoric and ideology? But we have an opportunity here to ensure that these particular weapons of war do not become an established part of warfare. But when it came to calling out real atrocities, Ardern could be remarkably selective. When it came to China, she was frightfully weak and inconsistent. 
What did you think when you saw that New Zealand wouldn't sign uh, the Five Eyes condemnations of China? There are clearly gross human rights abuses occurring in Xinjiang against Uyghurs. You know, let's be clear, we're talking about concentration camps here. And I think New Zealand did make an error of judgment in not signing that document. Jacinda Ardern certainly chooses her words on the issue very carefully. You can see from the smiles, everyone in the scrum is very pleased to have you here. <laughs> because when questioned about China, the Prime Minister's friendly front quickly disappears. But if you listen to the presenters of Australia and New Zealand public broadcasters, you think she was a saint. Uh, she's the greatest Prime Minister that's been in New Zealand in my lifetime. I'm 50. So she will go down eventually as a much beloved, but just, um, just one of the huge names. She's much admired internationally, but has been the subject of really aggressive political attacks at home in recent months. Don't forget she had to postpone her wedding to Clark Gayford because of the because of COVID. She's put a lot of things on hold. Well, Jacinda Ardern's tenure has been one of the most difficult in New Zealand's history. I, I don't think she was frightened of losing the next election. I think she was fr frightened more of winning it. I, I, I don't think I've seen a leader so popular or, or, or having so much influence on the world stage as Jacinda Ardern. <laughs> Sue says as much about modern journalism as it does about socialist prime ministers who've never had a job outside of politics. Best-selling author Douglas Murray summed it up best when he said Ardern excels at performative caring but lacks competence, adaptability and genuine empathy.